Uh, Dr. McGowan here at True You Weight Loss in North Carolina, and thanks for joining us. We will be doing right now a live full-length endoscopic revision of a gastric bypass, also called a transoral outlet reduction or TOR procedure. So we're going to walk through the entire procedure at real time, um, and hopefully this will be informative, educational. A couple of things that I want to mention initially. Our main focus here is safety. This is a patient that we're taking care of today, and this is a fairly complex procedure, so the priority is always safety. If for some reason we need to pause the stream, we'll do that, um, but just to let you know. Secondly, we want to have fun. This is actually a really cool procedure, and so we want to have a good time doing this, and we want to show you how we do this with our techniques. And third, again, we want to be educational and informative. So be sure to ask any questions. We are streaming this on multiple platforms right now. So just punch your questions in. We have a team here monitoring those and I will answer those as they come in while also focusing on explaining the procedure. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So this is a fully endoscopic procedure. So uh, we are using uh, Fuji endoscopes for this case today. And our patient is under anesthesia currently. She's sleeping. Uh, she does have a breathing tube in to protect her airway and she's receiving propofol uh, as her anesthesia. Jason here in the corner, um, we keep him off camera, but he is providing the anesthesia and keeping her comfortable and safe. So our patient today had a gastric bypass about seven years ago and has experienced some weight recurrence. Now we know that this can happen. Uh, no weight loss intervention is truly permanent. Gastric bypass is still the most effective weight loss intervention overall, but we know that weight recurrence can happen. And so we, what we need is tools that are safe and effective to treat that when it does occur to help patients get back on track. And we can talk through some of the reasons that patients may gain weight or regain weight. But one is purely anatomic. So I've just uh, entered the patient's uh, down the esophagus into the gastric pouch. So this is the patient's gastric pouch. And here is the anastomosis or connection between pouch and jejunum or small intestine. So when she had her bypass years ago, uh, her surgeon connected or recreated her stomach into a small pouch and connected it to the small intestine. But what's happened over time is that this has stretched out and dilated. And so our patient reported less of a sense of restriction, less fullness, less satiation with meals, and that can lead to weight regain. In fact, we know from studies more than 10 years ago that the size of this outlet directly correlates with weight regain. And so in this case, uh, this has dilated over time, and we're going to address that uh, right now. So this is the gastric pouch. This is the anastomosis, or what we call the outlet. And we're performing a transoral outlet reduction. We are going to reduce the outlet via the mouth. OK. So what I'd like to do first is just examine the pouch, make sure it's healthy. And hers is quite healthy. Uh, pretty normal size pouch. Outlet is, if I were to estimate, about 25 to 30 millimeters in diameter. When this was originally made years ago, uh, her initial size was probably around 15 millimeters. The bypass down here, the small intestine, has two components. There's a blind limb. This does not go anywhere. And then this is where food would traverse, which is the roux limb. And I noticed that she had a, has a couple of staples here from her surgery. I'm just going to remove those to begin with, uh, just so they don't get in the way of what we're about to do. And again, keep uh, supplying your questions, and we'll start answering those soon. But first, what I'm going to do is take these staples out. Now, when this surgery was originally done, this is a surgical uh, stapled anastomosis. There are actually staples all the way around here. You can't see them all. But these two have poked out over time. So I'm just going to remove them. So we're using a, just a grasping forceps. Go ahead and open and close. Open. And the reason I want to remove these is just because they could become a problem. Go ahead and close down the line. Open. I'm going to try to get the angle on this. I think right there. Close. So, all right. Open. Close here. Yeah. All right. So that's removed. And we'll go ahead and take that out. And then I'll take the second one out. So this wouldn't really interfere with our procedure today. But we're going to tighten down this outlet quite significantly. And we don't want those staples to cause any issues with that smaller opening down the line. And this is totally safe to do. The staples aren't doing anything at this point. A little bit of oozing is normal. A little bit of bleeding is normal. So just be aware if you're watching this, there, there can be a little bit of blood during this procedure. We are ultra magnified here, so uh, it's actually a lot less than it, it appears. So this other staple, we'll try to grab and remove. Though it's not protruding quite as much. Open. And close here. And one more time there. Open. 
suppose. It doesn't want to come out, but that's okay. Yeah, there it is, open. By the way, this is Roche next to me, close. Working the forceps, open, close. Roche's a master technician. He could line this forceps up properly, though. Sure. I appreciate it. Open. <laughs> now this is all on me. Close. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll leave that. The other one's fine. The other one's tiny. All right, so we've cleaned that out. And now what we're going to do is move on onto the process known as argon plasma coagulation. We're going to treat the anastomosis using heat to start the process of tightening this. That also has several other effects. But we're using an Irby... Uh, electrosurgical device. Uh, argon plasma coagulation is an uh, advanced technology where we're using a probe through the scope here, which will eject a stream of ionized uh, argon, and then an electrical, electrical current will run through that, um, cauterizing the tissue. We, we look at it as basically a mini blowtorch. Uh, but it's much more advanced than that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and do that. Now I'm controlling this with a foot pedal, uh, and I have this set to a pretty high wattage. Uh, generally, we'll use between 60 and 80 watts uh, on forced APC mode. We really want to uh, aggressively treat this, and we're going to treat it to uh, a very dark brown uh, color. So you'll see that process. And I'm just going to work my way around the anastomosis here, cauterizing as we go. And so what you'll see is the uh, outlet will start to tighten as we make our way around. And there you can see that flame. What I'm aiming for is the gastric side of the anastomosis. We don't want to burn the jejunum or the small intestine. So I'm going to treat this circumferentially. And just making my way around. And so this process alone will cause the outlet to tighten. Uh, and can lead to a reduction in size. But we're going to follow this with a circumferential purse string suture to really create a durable and tight outlet. So we want to be, again, pretty aggressive here. I'm aiming for dark brown, toasted marshmallow type appearance. What I'll do is make my way around a few times, aiming for about a centimeter or more uh, of a treated rim around this anastomosis. We just want to get full coverage. This also helps to create a bit of a lip or ridge that will then uh, make our suturing a bit easier. Uh, and if we have any questions, I can start now. First question is from Mark on Facebook. What size are you going to make the pouch now? Yeah, so the final size that we'll aim for in general is about eight millimeters. We found in our practice that that provides the optimal results uh, with the least uh, rate of complications or stenosis, and we will talk about those things. Complications are extraordinarily rare with this procedure, which is one of the main advantages. But we want to aim for uh, tight. The tighter, the better to a point. And a lot of patients come to us and say, make this thing as tight as you possibly can. And obviously, we could close this off completely. We don't want to do that. But we are going to aim for 8 millimeters. And you'll see the difference. That is quite tight. But it will still allow for food to pass through the anastomosis. But will provide a restored sense of satiety uh, and satiation. So this is nearly complete. Again, just treating, creating a nice rim around here. All right, if we have another question, I can field that. Next question is, what is the expected weight loss, and how does it compare with the weight loss you see during the initial gastric bypass? Yeah, so expected weight loss will vary based on patient and program. Uh, so we can really only speak to averages. Uh, and by the way, that is complete. Uh, so um, the outlet's treated. Now, we could, we could pause here and just complete the suturing of this anastomosis, which is the primary focus of this procedure. But I'm actually going to ablate the pouch as well, and I, I, can, I can speak to why that is. But as far as average weight loss, if you look at published studies, uh, if we can change the settings to, uh, we're gonna change to a pulsed APC at 30 watts. Thank you. If you look at published studies over the past decade, the average weight loss with this procedure is around 8% at uh, up to five years uh, after the, the procedure. Uh, in our program, we see uh, a higher rate of weight loss. We just uh, presented at Digestive Diseases Week earlier this year and, and currently have a manuscript uh, under review. Uh, our average weight loss is 17% at a year. We think there's several factors that contribute to that. One is the technique. 
which is really focusing on a purse string suturing technique, which I will uh, perform today. The other is follow-up. You know, we found that statistically the single greatest predictor of a patient's weight loss over that first year is how often we see them. So we're uh, very proactive uh, and hands-on in follow-up for our patients. We really think that's critical. All right, so uh, now I'm going to ablate. This is our technique at our center here in Cary and uh, with Dr. Maselli in Atlanta. We, we uh, prefer to ablate the gastric pouch mucosa prior to suturing that as well. So we're going to do an outlet revision and a gastroplasty of the pouch. And this is still somewhat in the investigational stages, but uh, ablating the mucosa of the pouch will allow it to uh, remodel and heal and tighten down um, along with the suturing that we'll do, which really creates... Uh, a very snug and durable uh, reduction in the pouch size as well. So I'm using a lower wattage here. We're not going for dark brown, just a little whitening or light yellow using this device uh, be just to uh, ablate the mucosa. And I'll, I'll suture over this uh, later on. So slightly different settings on this device as you can see, going for a lighter color. And I'll take another question now. Okay, this one's from AS on YouTube. Can you share how much weight regain the patient has had since her initial procedure? Yeah, so this, uh, our patient today, uh, as I mentioned, had her surgery uh, in 2017. So her story is actually a little more complex. She actually had a lap band many years ago, did quite well, but experienced complications from that. There was a band slippage that occurred and she had that removed, which so often happens with lap bands, which is why they've fallen out of favor. Uh, but then she converted to a gastric bypass. Now, uh, she lost it from a starting weight of 250 pounds to a uh, lowest weight of 170 pounds. And at her height, that's essentially ideal body weight uh, or normal body weight. So she had uh, an excellent response to her original surgery with 100% excess weight loss, which is quite good. Uh, and, but over the years, she's regained due to a variety of factors, life events. Uh, you know, things can get in the way. Things can happen. Uh, but ultimately lost that sense of restriction. Uh, and so she's not returned to her prior baseline weight, but um, the weight has been creeping back up, so um, she's looking to get back on track. And I've nearly finished this ablation process. So this is the region that I will be suturing uh, in a moment. I'll take another question now. Anne from Facebook wants to know, do you feel a burning when you're healing from this process? There's actually, uh, in terms of healing and recovery, because we're working endoscopically, there are, the symptoms are quite mild. You know, patients will vary in their response to this, so we're finished with that. We're going to switch scopes uh, real quick. This is a single channel endoscope. We're going to switch to a dual channel endoscope so we can suture. But as far as recovery, most of this is not felt. Uh, most patients will describe a sense of tightness, maybe some cramping, um, and that's generally it uh, over the course of a day to two days. So the recovery is pretty brief, much different than a surgical procedure where there's external incisions which can cause significant pain. So very different in terms of recovery. If you compare it to a surgical revision, which is a common question that we get and something we discuss with all of our patients, a surgical revision is much more complex, um, often not an option for patients due to the complexity and risk and does carry a much higher risk and longer recovery. Um, so with this, we're talking about shorter recovery, much lower risk. If you have another question, I'll, I'll take that now as well as we're changing scopes. This question's from Camila on Facebook. What will she be able to eat initially? So the diet progression after this procedure is very similar to what a patient would follow after their original bypass. We will follow clear liquids for a couple of days and then transition to full liquids for the next two to three weeks, then transitioning through purees and then ultimately to soft foods for a few weeks. So a gradual progression towards regular food. Ultimately, once she's reached the regular food stage, she'll be eating much smaller portions, but a full range um, and balanced nutrition working closely with her dietitian, that, which is key. So I'm gonna go ahead, what you can see now on the scope view, uh, if that's displaying or not yet, uh, is our dual channel scope. Now this is equipped with our endoscopic suturing system. This is the Apollo revised device, uh, which is FDA authorized specifically for this procedure in adults with a BMI of 30 to 50. And so this is an endoscopic suturing device. It's the same exact platform uh, or device that we use for the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. But in this case, we're using it for this revision procedure. So I'm controlling this externally with a handle, which will drive our needle internally. And you can see the blue suture material, which is a polypropylene uh, proline suture material. 
This is not dissolvable. The suture will remain in place. But what's really neat with this procedure is once everything heals nice and snug and tight, and uh, the suture is basically irrelevant um, because this will heal. And we'll show you some examples later on. So you can see uh, this is our treated anastomosis. So I'm going to perform a purse string suture. Now, there's a couple ways that this procedure can be performed. Uh, some people will use interrupted sutures. But what, what we know is that a purse string technique is more effective, meaning it leads to greater weight loss. It's more durable. And so we always want to aim for a purse string. Uh, we're quite particular about that in our program, and we do feel it's essential. Purse string suture, meaning we're going to suture all the way in a circle around one suture and then tighten that, just like you're tightening the, the string in a coin purse. So to begin, I'm going to rotate the scope about 180 degrees. Now, in general, I'm not going to use a grasper, a helix, or any other device to assist this. We're going to use the uh, anatomy to our advantage. We have a curved needle, and we have a ridge at the anastomosis. So this needle will cross from jejunum to gastric side. And then I'll repeat the process, rotating the scope in a counterclockwise manner to come all the way around. I'm always loading the suture in the direction I'm going, so to the right of the trailing suture. And I'm just going to repeat the process all the way around. I'll take a, maybe a couple more bites here and then answer some questions. So I'm going to space this maybe a centimeter or so apart. Again, driving needle across the anastomosis. This is a really sturdy way to suture. And um, this is a pretty efficient process, so I'm just going to make my way around here. Just going counterclockwise, and I will take a question now. Got a couple of technical questions from LinkedIn. This is from Dr. Fernandez. What is the extension of the APC area? What is the extension? Um, I, I'm guessing that refers to the treatment around the outlet, perhaps. Uh, generally, about a one centimeter margin. I think that's what that means. If you want to clarify that question, I can answer more specifically. I'll do that. The next technical question is from Pierre on LinkedIn. The gastrojejunal anastomosis can be lateral or terminolateral, which allows for easier endoscopic revision. Yeah, the easiest revision, and, and by the way, these can be really, every pouch is different, all anatomy is different. That's one of the uh, components of this procedure that makes it so interesting for us. You know, every patient's different. We really have to improvise at times. We really have to address the specific situation. But the best pouch, the best anatomy is a larger pouch with a directly uh, and FOSS uh, outlet straight ahead. I mean, that's going to be the easiest always. And if you have a nice ridge, kind of a raised separation between um, pouch and jejunum, it just makes this much, much easier. But we will encounter outlets that are off to the side, you know, all different directions. Sometimes that makes it technically a little more challenging, but we still always want to try to aim for a purse string. And sometimes it just takes a little bit more body mechanics and maneuvering. Sometimes we'll use a helix or grasper if needed. But uh, again, generally not necessary. So I'm just making my way around here still. This yep. question is from Ann on Facebook. How bad is the cramping for most patients and do you provide medication? The cramping afterwards is mild. Uh, again, everyone's different. Uh, we do provide uh, antispasm medication. We do provide pain medication. Some patients may have actual pain, though it's uncommon. Some patients feel nothing. In fact, we warn all of our patients, you may feel nothing. That's completely normal. Uh, but they need to understand that we've actually done quite a bit of work and uh, to respect that things are quite tight internally. But uh, generally, these symptoms are on the mild side. So here, there's less of a ridge to grab with our suturing system. As you can see, it's kind of a flat area in the anastomosis. We do encounter this. Um, this is a situation where I may use a helix, or I may just try to maneuver the scope here a bit to get more of an angle. And I will take another question now. All right, this is a question from YouTube. Mm -hmm. A surgeon from China wants to know if it's possible to study ESG in your center. So perhaps you can talk about some of your research. Research in our center, yeah, I'll take a helix by the way. We do have uh, multiple ongoing studies. We have a research team and research division uh, looking at uh, various things. But yeah, we're, we're very interested in research. Uh, this field, though not new, is still in many ways in its infancy. And there's just so many exciting things going on and, and advancement in, in all these areas. With this procedure, with endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, um, just so much room for improvement and advancement. Uh, so again, there's a flat area in the anastomosis here. So to assist, I'm going to use a helical grasper, a helix device. I'm going to go around our suture here. Roche is going to d drive that right here into the anastomosis, just maybe three turns. That's going to allow me to capture that tissue. Then I can rotate into position and create some lift here. And then I've sutured through the anastomosis, so just a little bit of assistance there. 
I'm always driving the needle from jejunal to gastric side. We really want to maintain that uh, direction. Yes. Anne from Facebook wants to know how many sutures are placed close up to the outlet. Number of sutures. So for the purse string, it's one. Uh, and then we will place an additional, depending on the size of the pouch, an additional two to three in general um, to complete the entire procedure. But the purse string itself is, by definition, one suture. So we've come uh, back to essentially where we started. I'm going to continue. You can take that now. We're going to continue and overlap another uh, stitch or two from where we began. Yes. AS from YouTube wants to know, at this time, does insurance, do any insurance programs cover this procedure, or is it considered cosmetic? So insurance coverage um, is, is still not in place in general with this procedure. Uh, it's not a cosmetic procedure per se, but uh, it does not have a defined procedural code yet, so there are some steps that need to occur. The first step, an important one, one was the FDA authorization for this procedure utilizing this device, which was last summer. Uh, so that's the first step in that process, but it is a, a multi-year process for ins routine insurance coverage to occur. So I'm being mindful of my sutures, so I'm not, I am kind of wrapped around the tower here, so I'm going to unwind that. There we go. Okay, so I've come all the way around and beyond a bit. So we are ready at this point to tighten this. Now, I could pull this tight, as you can see, and completely close it shut. We don't want to do that. That would not be uh, pleasant. But what we're going to do is tighten this over a balloon using a, to size it. So what I'm going to do is drop my needle tip, which becomes an anchor. And we are going to load a balloon through the scope, through the outlet. We're going to inflate that to 8 millimeters. And then we will tighten. Then I can tighten the suture down all the way really tight, it will not get tighter than eight millimeters. So, uh, Karen, our nurse Karen, thank you, has a through the scope balloon, which is inflated with uh, water. And I'm going to pass this through, following the rue limb, so up and to the right is where that was located. And then we're going to load a cinching device. So this cinch will tighten that suture and lock and cut it. And then this suture will stay in place. And I will take another question now. Camila from Facebook wants to know, is there a need to assess the diameter of the opening prior to the procedure? Not really. So uh, in general, just based on a patient's story, on their history, uh, we will know if things have stretched. It's also generally inevitable that the outlet will stretch over time. Um, so if a patient reports the ability to eat larger portions, we can be pretty confident that things have dilated. So we do not pre-screen every patient, uh, just knowing from experience that um, it's, it's not necessary. Uh, once in a while, we'll encounter an outlet that's not overly dilated, but we're dealing with a large pouch. And in that scenario, we might focus more on the pouch, less on the outlet. But in most cases, the issue is the outlet. So I'm feeding this uh, cinch through, positioning it at the anastomosis. And then we're going to inflate our balloon to 8 millimeters, which is 10 ATMs. So this balloon is across the anastomosis, ensuring that we don't over-tighten. Just let me know when that's there. We're good? OK. And then I'll tighten the suture. It's going to get some fluid out of there so everyone can see. I do want to maintain some level of visualization here. And I'm going to pull this nice and tight. So that's pulling in taut against the balloon. I, I realize that you can't see, but I'm doing this based on feel at this point. I will add a little bit of CO2 here just to get a look, make sure we're snug. And I'll pull that in a bit more. And we'll go ahead and cinch right here and deflate the balloon. All right, so that's exactly eight millimeters. We're done with the balloon. The balloon comes out now. So we've gone from around 30 or so millimeters to begin with to exactly eight. And you can see that. And then I'm actually going to reinforce this uh, just proximal to the anastomosis. And then we'll work on the pouch here. So we want to add a little bit of uh, extra strength to the anastomosis. OK. DreamI85 from YouTube wants to know, how long should a patient wait to do a revision? And is two years too early? So as far as timing for a revision, it really depends on the story. I mean, uh, weight recurrence 
can begin as soon as 18 months after a gastric bypass. That's when most patients will experience around a 5 to 10 percent weight recurrence. That's completely normal. By 10 years, the average patient regains 30 percent of the weight they lost. Uh, but everyone's story is different. Everyone's an individual. Uh, generally, for a gastric bypass revision, our patients will be at least several years out. Our average patient is 13 years from the time of their original surgery. But we see a range from between seven and more than 20 years. So it really just kind of depends on the circumstances, the story, and the patient's individual situation. So I'm going to go ahead and place a suture just proximal to the anastomosis where we've just uh, completed the purse string to add a little bit of uh, reinforcement. And I, I like to do a semicircular reinforcing suture here. Go ahead. So Roche is again working that helix so I can grasp tissue, pull it towards the scope, and then suture. I will take another question now. Leonard from YouTube again. Can this procedure be used to convert a sleeve to a gastric bypass? And here. Uh, this could not convert uh, a sleeve to a bypass. We do have a separate, uh, somewhat related procedure to revise a uh, gastric sleeve. Let's actually go right there. Uh, which is more akin to the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. So we can uh, endoscopically tighten uh, a sleeve gastrectomy to make it smaller um, using the same suturing setup. Camila on Facebook wants to know what restrictions are in place after the procedure, lifting weights, back to work, all of that. So we generally ask our patients to just take it easy for a few days. They can generally return to work in um, three to five days, sometimes sooner, but we just say take it easy. Um, there are no restrictions in terms of lifting. Because we're working completely internally, um, no external incisions, we don't really need to be as careful about that. Uh, so we just tell our patients to listen to their bodies, not overdo it, but we frankly want them to get back into activity as soon as they're able. Uh, and usually that's uh, right away. Here. Mark on Facebook wants to know, what do you think her total weight loss will be? Here. Uh, as far as what she'll lose, uh, again, it's completely dependent, uh, largely dependent on the individual, but I, I would speak to the averages. I know that on average she'll lose 17% of her body weight, um, and so I would expect that, assuming she's working closely with our team uh, that's the average I would expect. We'll go ahead and cinch here. Now, in terms of aftercare, again, I had mentioned that the key, the most important factor in how well this patient will do. The technique matters a lot. The tool matters a lot. But that aftercare is key. In our program, our patients work closely with their registered dietitian. We have an entire team, a division of uh, dietitians. Uh, and we've also recently added in health coaching, we, which we think is uh, really essential. So we're talking about maximal support. So each patient will work with a dietitian and a uh, board certified health coach to really ensure they do their absolute best, not just in losing weight, but also maintaining. You know, we're talking about a second chance here. We want our patients to do their absolute best. We understand that weight recurrence uh, brings along with it feelings of guilt and shame and failure. And uh, the fact is, obesity is a chronic relapsing condition. Weight regain will occur. Uh, we just need to manage it, and we want to manage it as effectively as possible. Now, I'm cinching this reinforcing suture. Uh, go ahead and cinch there. So that's going to add a little bit of strength, just proximal to that uh, revi the outlet revision. And so there's our opening. Now, we, we know that is still 8 millimeters. It's very snug, but that is an exact 8 millimeter uh, revision. And now I'm going to work on the pouch a little bit. You can see where we ablated the mucosa. I'm going to suture over that to perform a gastroplasty, much like we would do with an ESG, but on a much smaller field. Next question, what BMI do you need to qualify for this procedure? So in general, the, well, the FDA indication for this procedure is a BMI of 30 to 50. We, we can perform this procedure outside of those ranges on an off-label basis. And, and this is where it really matters uh, what the individual patient's story is. You know, there's some advantage to intervening earlier rather than later. So a patient who's done quite well with their bypass but is just beginning to regain and, and feeling that loss of restriction may benefit from this at a slightly lower BMI. You know, we're, we'll talk to our patients and just figure out if this is appropriate uh, for them as an individual. Okay. Dr. Mustafa from YouTube wants to know if you ever do training inside your center for gastroenterologists from outside of the country. We do, uh, we do welcome physicians to come and learn and train and um, you know, see, see how we do these procedures. We always like to educate um, on these types of platforms, but also in person. Um, I think that the best way to learn is in person. These are really technical procedures. Uh, it, it takes a fair amount of training. 
there's a, there, these are really safe when done properly. They're really effective when done properly, but those two key components have to be maintained. Um, this procedure is not effective if it's not performed properly. So I mentioned the key with a purse string uh, revision. That's essential. Uh, you know, we want to make sure we're doing this uh, as effectively as possible. So training is key. From Kate Does ESG, is it true that you can never drink with a straw after this procedure? Uh, thank you, Kate. No, that's, that's largely a myth. So we will tell patients to avoid using a straw in the very beginning because uh, you'll swallow air when you're using a straw and that can just create a sense of fullness and bloating. It could be uncomfortable. Um, it's not lifelong. It's not for a year. There's really no evidence to support that, but it's something we recommend. Now, carbonation is uh, something we do recommend avoiding. Carbonation, carbonated drinks, will cause a fair amount of stretch on a pouch, uh, on a sleeve, and so we do recommend avoiding that. We don't want to create excess tension on this. And again, it would make you feel uncomfortable. Right here. How often do you perform these procedures, and how many have you done? Uh, this is uh, a routine procedure that we perform. Uh, in our practice, which is entirely uh, endoscopic bariatrics, this, our, our primary procedure, probably most frequent procedure, is the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. This would be a close second. Uh, so it's something we perform on a, on a daily basis. Um, to date, I've performed, my, or myself and Dr. Maselli in Atlanta have performed um, uh, close to 500 uh, of these procedures. It is uh, technically, arguably, my favorite procedure because, again, every patient's different, all the anatomy is different, but it's really exciting to see what we can do here uh, and what the end result is and how well it works. So I'm doing a running suture, by the way, so I'm going from anterior wall of the pouch to posterior wall and then back around, uh, and that will reduce the size of the pouch. I'll take another question. How do the risks of this procedure compare with the bariatric revision? Yeah, vastly different risk profile compared to a surgical revision. Uh, if you look at studies of surgical revision, the complication rate is quite high. Depending on the study you look at, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent complication rate. Uh, that is very high. With this, is less than 1 percent owing to the endoscopic approach. Uh, things can happen. There can be, you see some bleeding here, but there could be uh, bleeding, there could be uh, infection, you know, things can happen, we are suturing. But the rate is well less than 1%. Uh, in fact, in our program, we've uh, only had one patient here with a, in five years who had a bleeding episode that was treated just a few hours after the procedure and resolved. Uh, that's all we've seen, but we tell every patient things can happen. We have to be in very close contact um, because the risk would be early on. But the nice thing here is we're working directly inside. At the conclusion of the procedure, I'll know if there's any residual bleeding. We'll know how things look, uh, and then we can feel really comfortable with this. I'm actually going to go ahead and cinch right here. So that suture is completed. I think I'll do one more uh, after this, and then we will be complete with this procedure. All right, I'll take another question. Pierre from LinkedIn would like to know, do you use GLP-1 treatment before or after revisions? So the GLP-1 medications uh, do have a role. Um, in general, we know the weight loss with this procedure in isolation. The 17% I mentioned is in patients who were not on any medication. Uh, but sometimes a patient will need to lose um, significantly more than that. So we'll be, want to be proactive, and we could add medications early on. Or a patient who has this procedure uh, or any weight loss procedure and is losing a little slower than we might expect or they might uh, want, we could certainly add on a medication. So com combination therapy uh, is definitely uh, a, a great option. Not necessary for most people, but it's something that we like to be proactive about. We're talking about a revision. You know, we're talking about a patient who we need to provide the maximum amount of support for. And if that includes procedure plus medications, we'll do anything that we need to do, anything possible to help. So I'm cinching this suture. And then we'll have one more suture after this. So we're coming down the home stretch here. Just a few minutes left in this procedure. Go ahead and cinch. OK. Anne from Facebook wants to know, if you decide to do the procedure, procedure in the hospital, is it because of a higher risk versus doing it in your office? So the vast majority of our procedures are performed uh, here in an ambulatory surgery center. Um, we do perform some in a hospital environment, generally just our patients with uh, higher BMIs or other comorbidities, uh, where we want just a, a higher level of monitoring and support uh, during the procedure. It's still performed as a same-day procedure, uh, and so everything else is identical. So again, you can see our little outlet in the distance, and our gastroplasty here, so that pouch is much smaller. 
I plan for one more suture here. It's looking pretty snug. Um, so we may actually conclude this procedure right here. I, I'd like to defer to Roche on these matters. <laughs> I think we could do one little here, right here. I agree. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and put one more suture. Yeah, I'll take another question. Camila on Facebook wants to know, do you stay overnight after the procedure? Maybe speak to folks that are coming from across the country. Oh, for tra patients traveling. Well, first of all, you do not stay overnight. Uh, you go home after this. So our patient will wake up from the procedure, recover for an hour uh, or so. Uh, once she's awake, comfortable, taking some sips of liquids, we'll let her head home. Now, she's actually from out of state. She'll um, head back to her hotel, stay overnight nearby, and then we'll see her tomorrow morning for follow-up. That's really important, so we'll make sure she's recovering well. Uh, we'll provide some extra IV fluid so she can just kind of relax and not feel like she's forcing liquids in, and then we can say, okay, you're safe to return home. So we, we certainly have patients travel from elsewhere. We generally advise staying in town a few days. Uh, it never hurts to just recover nearby uh, and then make the trip back home. Uh, but because of the advances in virtual care, we can do all of our follow-up uh, virtually after the procedure um, and in fact it reduces one of the barriers to follow-up which is logistics so we really embrace that all right last suture here we're just gonna do a little straight line coming down to reinforce this a little more and I'll take another question can you have more than one revision in your lifetime and if so is there a time limit between them uh, uh, you can certainly have more than one revision I mean it really depends on the scenario it depends on the nature of what the initial revision was uh, we have patients who have had prior surgical revisions and um, maybe they weren't uh, effective or, or uh, weight recurrence uh, happened again here. Uh, and so we can go in and, and tighten things uh, again if needed. That is the beauty of the endoscopic approach where we can uh, really address almost any scenario safely. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, um, do I need to exercise after I have this procedure? Is that part of the program? Uh, exercise is definitely important. Uh, the, the foundation of our program would be nutrition, uh, healthy eating, healthy habits, but always we'll encourage exercise here. Um, if nothing else, it's going to help significantly with recovery early on, but th the other thing is as you're losing weight, you will uh, inevitably lose some lean muscle mass. That is normal, uh, and we want to maintain and rebuild that as soon as possible. So we do encourage uh, both uh, cardiovascular, cardio exercise, but also strength or resistance exercise as much as possible. So let's, I think we'll cinch right there. And then we will be finished. Uh, normally this procedure is about 30 minutes or less uh, in duration depending on the uh, patient and their anatomy. Why haven't I heard of this procedure before now and why hasn't my physician told me about it? This procedure is not new uh, actually. This was originally developed and pioneered um, by Dr. Chris Thompson at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, more than a decade ago, uh, but it's a very uh, specialized procedure. So it's only performed routinely at, um, even to this day, uh, a few high volume centers, academic centers in particular, or, or higher volume uh, private practices. Um, so it's not something that every gastroenterologist can or will do. Uh, we are seeing such interest in this field now and advancement, and so I, I, we will see much more availability of this in the coming years. So I'm cinching this final suture, and we'll go ahead and do that there. So that's cinched. Okay, now uh, let's take a look here. So pouch, much smaller. I think you have a sense of that. Outlet is very small but patent, and then this will heal exactly in that size. Now what's really cool is how this looks when it heals. We actually have an example, and um, we can go ahead and project that on the screen of a patient who had this procedure so on the left panel, you can see what the outlet looked like before the procedure. Immediately after, it looks remarkably like this one. Uh, and then uh, the third panel shows three months later, and you can see complete healing. This looks like a fresh, completely healed, beautiful outlet, but much, much smaller. Uh, and so we can take that image down. But that's, that's what this heals like. And a lot of patients will ask us about durability of this procedure. One thing we know is that this is a very durable procedure. The amount of scar tissue that we're inducing internally with the APC and then the strength of the healing process that the purse string uh, conveys means it heals exactly like that and it is highly unlikely that it will stretch again, assuming that it's performed properly. So we know that the weight loss is durable. Uh, and so there's two, two benefits to this procedure. There's the initial weight loss and we can talk about percentages and how much a patient will lose. But then there's the weight maintenance component. And what we're achieving is we're changing the trajectory of that patient's weight path. 
you know, over the past several years, it's been climbing. We're lowering the weight and then helping them maintain. So completely changing that trajectory, which would naturally continue to increase if we don't intervene. So uh, that is the process. Any remaining questions? Or, yeah, go ahead. Is there anyone who is not a candidate for this procedure? Who is not a candidate? Well, there's a few things we look at. First of all, we want to make sure that a patient has responded well to their original surgery. Uh, we'd like to see, strictly speaking, uh, that a patient who had a bypass lost at least 50% of their excess weight with that initial surgery, which would be considered a, a, an optimal response. So we'd like to see that the initial surgery worked. Uh, we want to exclude certain things that would interfere, uh, certain comorbidities, active tobacco use, um, but there's not much else. We can perform this procedure if patients are on blood thinners. We can just pause them briefly. Uh, but there are some anatomic issues. So in a rare scenario, a patient may have a, a gas, what's called a gastrogastric fistula, you know, a connection to the remnant stomach, which, which can be problematic. We actually had a patient yesterday who came in and had this procedure with a gastrogastric fistula. We were able to close that and perform the procedure. But that's one that can interfere with this. Patients who have a ring or band um, at the outlet can be problematic. We can't perform the revision in the same way. So there are a couple little nuances in the patient's history that we would want to clarify. But generally speaking, if the patient is in good health, has responded to her original surgery, but has experienced weight recurrence, they are a candidate for this. Uh, another question, would protein shakes help with healing as they do with the RU and Y? Proteins are critically important. Uh, during this process, after this procedure, or any weight loss procedure, we're, because we're advancing the diet so slowly on liquids for several weeks, the, the key is protein. As long as our patients maintain their protein, uh, they will heal well, they'll recover well, their energy will rebound quickly, and they'll preserve as much as their lean muscle mass as possible. So the beginning is all about protein. Uh, we will discuss the goals for an individual patient, but generally speaking, 60 grams per day minimum, and for some individuals, we're going to aim for higher. And there's great protein shakes these days, so it's actually quite doable. We have a patient who is having this procedure in July, and she is 22 years out and wants to know if how far out she is has any impact on the procedure. So uh, the surgical techniques have evolved over time. We do see that. Uh, we can see different techniques from decade to decade, but 20 plus years is not unusual for us. Um, we will, of course, we'll meet with that patient and talk through what their surgical experience was, if they had any complications, if we can identify any um, procedural characteristics from the original surgery, things I mentioned, like was a band or ring used. Uh, but if it was a Rue and Y bypass, uh, at that time, absolutely not a, not a problem and certainly a candidate for the procedure. Okay, super. Oh, one more? They're coming. Coming? Okay, no worries. Kind of done here, but I think I'll hand the scope off to you. All right. There we go. Uh, by the way, uh, another uh, shout out to Jason Tischer here who provided anesthesia. Thank you. Um, our patient was just perfect during this procedure. Uh, Roche, master endoscopy technician. Karen, thank you. Colleen, thanks for fielding the questions. Thanks to our team, uh, camera crew. Our last question, I feel like you've already addressed, but just to get it out there one last time, can the outlet stretch after the tour? Can the, so I would never say never, but again, if this procedure is done properly, it is very unlikely that things will stretch over time. Now, patients can adapt to the smaller size. That is normal. You know, over time, you, your, the stomach will adapt. Uh, so portion size will increase a little bit, but generally we'll settle in at a much smaller portion than the patient's currently tolerating, uh, and, and then we can just focus on those healthy habits and balance and just a healthy lifestyle. Okay, super. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I thank you for the questions. Hopefully this was informative. And that concludes the procedure. So thank you again.